was his body stolen? Let's look at how they said it. His disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. These are the words of the soldiers who were posted around the tomb and kept there very specifically to see that nothing happened to the body. That was the picture. Pilate said, go ahead and put a guard so that nobody tampers with the body. And then the soldiers said, his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. You read that sentence and you know it's false. You know why? Because you are either asleep or you're awake. You can't be both. If you are asleep, how did you know that the disciples came and stole? And if you were awake, then you had the shields and the swords and the spears. How come you stop, didn't stop them? So that sentence itself tells you that is internally inconsistent to say, I was asleep, but I know who did it. The handkerchief, according to the story, was folded and kept in a place. Now honestly, which thief comes to your house to fold your clothes? No. The scene of a thievery is material that is rifled through. It is disorder. Nobody comes to steal and fold clothes when they know that the guard is just outside there. That you cannot explain. Folding clothes when you want to steal? No. Number three is, why did the Romans strip a person completely naked when they put them on the cross? It is only the artists who have put the loincloth around Jesus in their drawings. A person who was crucified was crucified stark naked. Do you know why? Because everybody knew that this person was so vile. His crime was so heinous that they would have to drag away from him every last vestige of dignity. So strip him up completely naked and put him up there for the world to see his shame. And then we are telling now, because when we look at the story, the body was gone, but the clothes, the wrappings were still inside the tomb. And therefore we must make the theory that the disciples took out a naked body. Now I come from the East. The relationship between a follower and a guru is very close and very loyal and very respectful. It's a psychological hurdle I am unable to cross when I see this. When they tell me that the disciples took away his naked body, you are trying to tell me that they were doing exactly what the Romans wanted to do to him and shame him completely to the last degree? Why would they do that? There is no explanation because no follower of a revered guru or teacher in the East will ever even hint of exposing the nakedness of his master. That would be an unthinkable suggestion. And so to me, who comes from the country where it really took place, in the East, Eastern parts, I find it a psychological hurdle I cannot cross. Because no follower will unwrap and make him naked, shame him and take him out. What were they doing unwrapping him? There is no explanation to that either. If they came to steal, tell me, isn't it so much smarter to just pick the body and run? Why take the time to unwrap? And it's difficult to unwrap uh, the, the cloth which has myrrh in it. Myrrh is a thing that causes it to become hard, firm. You unwrap that, again, no explanation over there. Hard to give an explanation. And number four or five, what motive did they have to do that? Had they planned earlier to do that and say he would rise from the dead, only then they would do it. Are you with me? 
if they had made it planned as a conspiracy. But if there was such a conspiracy, then why did they run away from the, in the Garden of Gethsemane? They all ran and left him alone. If they really had a plan to tell the world that he was going to rise from the dead, then why would Peter deny a small damsel's pointing finger? If they really had the conspiratory plan, then he would have told that lady, he said, hey, come here. You see him now? Spat upon, slapped, derided, let me tell you something. He looks bad today. Wait till Sunday morning. Then we'll see who really, he really is. If they had a, conspiration, a conspiratory plan. But no, he ran away himself. And so they had really no motive. They were afraid. Why would they do this against the whole Roman Empire? Hard to find reasons. And therefore... The disciples, we say, have no motive. They don't anticipate his resurrection. If they had, they would not have fled or denied him. Now we go to the other side. If the story is true, just say that the story is true. Do we have today any evidences that have been left around to say that the story might be true? There are three. The after effects of what happened, eyewitnesses, and what is known as dying declaration or deathbed confession. After effects, the change in the disciples and the fact of the Christian church. Perhaps the transformation of the disciples of Jesus is the greatest evidence of all for the resurrection. A little band of defeated cowards cowering in an upper room one day and a few days later transformed into a company that no persecution could silence. They were willing to face arrest, imprisonment, beatings and horrible deaths and not one of them recanted of his belief that Christ had risen. The think of the psychological absurdity of attempting to attribute this dramatic change to nothing more convincing than a miserable fabrication they were trying to foist upon the world that simply wouldn't make sense. If you are saying that they were doing that, you are relegating them to a stage or a level much less than your own mind. And that's not fair. What gives us the right to say that it was a fabricated story that they were trying to make up? Why would they make up such a story? Psychological absurdity. You know why? Because let's imagine. Let's imagine. Twelve people. We call them together and talk to them. And tell them, hey, you know and I know he died. You know and I know we stole his body. And we put him in our backyard, in a bag and buried him. So now, I am telling you twelve to go and tell the world he rose up from the dead. Oh, so we twelve are going to tell the people he rose up from the dead? And what will the people do to us? priests and the Jewish leaders, what they do to us, nothing much, they'll just slap you, that's all. They'll just kick you around. They'll just whip you. They'll just imprison you. And finally they'll put you to death. Oh. So, really, what will it be for us, you know? Nothing. Just go die, that's all. But make sure you tell the story. Tell them exactly how it happened. He rose up from the dead. And then when we tell them that, they will slap us, they will spit on our face, they will imprison us, they will torture us, and they will kill us. That's right. And these twelve looked at each other and held hands and looked and said, Yippee! Let's go! Honestly, honestly, is that how any mind thinks when you know yourself? In other words, what we are telling us that these disciples knew that their body was dead and gone. They had in one of their backyards a hole in the ground in which there was a bag, in which there was some rotting flesh and broken bones, 
And six weeks later, they stood in front of the crowds in Jerusalem and said that that bag of rotting flesh and broken bones is the prince of life. And they said it with such conviction. 3,000 Jews dropped their lifelong tradition, gave it up, and decided that very day to follow this man. Tell me, can you tell a lie so strongly? After Jesus was gone, the 11 disciples realized that Jesus originally had 12. And so they wanted to choose one person who would take the place and make the group 12 again. And this is how they did it. These are the characteristics. Therefore, all these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become witness with us, not of his teachings, but of his resurrection. If you want to be a part of the twelve, this club has two criteria. Membership in this club has two criteria. One, you should have been with him all along. Number two, you should be witness of his resurrection. That's it. Don't worry about his teachings. That's secondary. First of all, you should say that you knew him. And secondly, you must say that you saw him alive with your own eyes. Only then you can join this group of twelve. Christianity stands or falls with the truth of the resurrection. Once you disprove it, you have disposed of Christianity. Because Christianity came not at the cross, but after that. Because at the cross, everything was finished, like we saw a moment ago. The resurrection gave significance to all that they did. The institution of the church, then, is a historical phenomenon explained only by Jesus' resurrection. It's a historical phenomenon because you and I can see it. Today there is something known as Christianity. There is something known as the Christian church. You trace it back from today, this date, it will go back and the only place it really stops as a point of, of, of its origin is the resurrection. Before that, there is nothing much. Without that, there is nothing much. Eyewitnesses. Do you know that this piece of literature which is we call today the New Testament. It's an ancient piece of literature. Originally it was only in manuscript form, handwritten. It is the only piece of literature which talks about a story to which there were eyewitnesses. No other writing has that feature. Every other writing Somebody else saw. Nobody ever saw Gautama Buddha being enlightened under the fig, uh, ficus tree. Nobody ever saw Muhammad on Mount Hira talking to Angel Gabriel. All they accepted was what they said. In this instance, this is the only literature where the people who wrote down said, I saw. An eyewitness is one of the strongest judicial pieces of testimony you can ever bring to a court of law. Those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses, but were eyewitnesses of His Majesty. He who has seen has testified. That which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. What words? You will never find these words in any other ancient literature. The very kind of evidence which modern science and even psychologists are so insistent upon for determining the reality of any object under consideration is the kind of evidence that we have presented to us in the Gospels regarding the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, namely, the things that are seen with the human eye, touched with the human hand, and heard by the human ear. This is what we call empirical evidence. It's not a philosophy. It's an evidence. Dying declaration or uh, deathbed confession. Why does a court of law place so much emphasis on a deathbed confession? And they do. 
Because everybody in their back of their minds reach a point when they are facing death where they say, okay, I'll tell the truth. I've got nothing to lose now. I'll tell the truth. And so a deathbed confession from an eyewitness becomes one of the highest levels of evidence in any court of law. And if we go to one such witness, and this witness says, I saw, and he also says, so and so also saw, and we with our attorney ran to the other person and found this other person also on his deathbed and we ask him the story and he says I saw and he says the same thing as the other person who just died then two or three deathbed confessions are very difficult to overthrow in a court of law today of the same thing we have not just one, two or three. All of them died with the same story. Peter was crucified upside down. James was stoned to death. Matthew killed by the sword. James, the son of Alphaeus, was crucified. James, the son of Zebedee, was killed by the sword. Thaddeus was shot through with arrows. Bartholomew was crucified. Andrew was crucified. Philip was crucified. Simon the Zealot was crucified. Thomas was killed with a spear. Paul was beheaded. Every single one of them, no exception, facing death. And they were facing death because they were saying this. How easy would it have been for them to say, okay, let me tell you the truth. He didn't rise, he rose up from, yeah, we buried him there, let me go home now. Come on. How easy would it have been? Let me go home to my family. Why should I die for, sir, for what I know to be a complete and total hoax? But no. They faced every one of them. And they didn't die all together, boom, one shot. One, then another, then another over months and years. It was enough of time for people like you and me to sit down and reconsider Shall I or shall I not stand by this? Why should I stand by this when he is dying for it? So they are going to kill me too. If you knew it to be a hoax and a lie, would it not be so much more reasonable in your own minds to tell the truth and save your skin? But none of them went back. We'll slap you. You can. We'll spit on your face. He rose up. We will whip you. He rose. We'll imprison you in stocks. He rose. We'll kill you. You can do anything you want. I saw him before. I walked and talked with him. I saw him as the risen person afterwards in bodily form. And let me tell you why I'm dying. Because he who has conquered death has told me that he will impart to me eternal life. And not only to me, friend, you want to kill me? Let me tell you, if you believe in him, he'll give you also eternal life. Go ahead and kill me. And every one of them went to his death. I don't think it is fair for us today, 2,000 years later, to say, well, they were just cooking up a story. You can't die for a cooked up story. It is too hard to give an explanation other than the fact that probably, most probably, they were telling the truth of the matter. So indeed, taking all the evidence together, it is not too much to say that there is no historic incident better or more variously supported than the resurrection of Christ. By all rules, not of philosophy or religion, by all rules of evidence, his bodily resurrection from the grave can be adjudged the best proof fact of all of ancient history. On that greatest point, we are not merely asked to have faith. In its favor, as living truth, there exists such overwhelming evidence, positive and negative, factual and circumstantial, that no intelligent jury in the world could fail to bring in a verdict that the resurrection story is true. That's a quotation from Lord Darling, who is the Chief Justice of England. 
Now, can you imagine a Chief Justice saying overwhelming evidence and bringing his gavel down? Don't you think you and I who are ordinary people should give it some credibility? That a Chief Justice of a nation says there is overwhelming evidence here? Thousands and tens of thousands of persons have gone through it piece by piece as carefully as every judge summing up a most important case. I have myself done it many times over, not to persuade others but to satisfy myself. And I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer than that Christ died and rose again from the dead. And he is not just like you and me who walk the streets. He is... Chairman of the Department of Modern History from Oxford University. Arnold Toynbee wrote a huge compendium of history, study of history. In that he devoted 80 pages to study anybody who called themselves a savior. Savior of the world, savior of the nation, savior of a community, maybe savior of the family, Anyone who called themselves savior, he studied. This is what he said. When we first set out on this quest, we found ourselves moving in the midst of a mighty marching host. In the last stage of all, our motley host of would-be saviors, human and divine, has dwindled to a single company of none but gods. At the final ordeal of death, few, even of these would-be savior gods, have dared to put their title to the test by plunging into the icy river, meaning death, and now as we stand and gaze with our eyes fixed upon the farther shore, meaning what happened after death, a single figure rises from the flood and straightway fills the whole horizon. There is the Savior. He was looking to see who the Savior was. How did he test himself? There's only one person in history who has tested himself as a Savior by saying, I can be killed, but I will rise again. There is absolutely no parallel to this except in mythological writings. And we saw again, the basis of what we are saying is that this writing is not mythological or legendary. The bones of Abraham and Muhammad and Buddha and Confucius and Lao Tzu and Zoroaster are still here on earth. Jesus' tomb is empty. It is the concrete, factual, empirical proof that life has hope and meaning, love is stronger than death, goodness and power are ultimately allies and not enemies, life and not death wins in the end. God has touched us right here where we are and has defeated our last enemy. We are not cosmic orphans. We've gone these three evenings from one concept to another and we have tried our best to evaluate any evidence. Now, does that mean all the evidence is that this is there is this is all the evidence there is? No. What I have done is not told you to think of these things as I have thought. All I am saying is, I have presented to you the way I thought this thing out. So let's summarize what we did. The New Testament is the best documented ancient writing in the world. It is solidly historical in nature. The top feature of writing is beyond human capability. Remember the cross-referencing and so the source living for 1400 years? Beyond human capability. Only the Bible's challenge is open and clear, which is predictive prophecy. And it fulfills its own challenge very impressively. Jesus dared to make the highest claim, Son of God. He did not just bring the truth, the way, and the life. He was the way, the truth, and the life. That was his claim. Number six, Jesus is the only one in whom the theory of teaching was matched by actual practice in life. Therefore, the only one with the right to say, follow me. Jesus' ministry was the shortest and yet had the greatest impact. The only founder to be born illegitimate. The only founder to die the violent, shameful death of a condemned criminal and the only one to go into the domain of death, the most feared enemy of humankind and break those bands and come back as a conqueror over death. Ten questions. And so I had to make my conclusion, doesn't have to be yours, my conclusion, Jesus and the Bible are actually unmatched in their credibility. They have 
the highest credibility that I have found in any claim, in any writing in all the world today. And therefore, they provide to mankind, meaning me, what I had looked for 20 years, the only way. I'm not asking you to accept that. All I ask you is to think in your minds, well, he has presented some evidence. He possibly does have a reason to believe the way he does. That's all I ask of you. And once you say that, then I say, well now, you go and find a reason for your belief. Thank you.